whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. Hello, welcome to Planet America. I'm John Barron. And I'm Chaz Dachidala. President Trump sets an ambitious target to reopen America. So I would love to have the country opened up and uh, just raring to go by Easter. But things are getting worse, not better, and there's not been helped by advice like this. You need nano silver toothpaste. You need super silver. You need super blue. President Trump continues to play the part of cheerleader-in-chief, promising the COVID-19 pandemic will be over soon, the market will bounce back, and he wants measures including social distancing to end by Easter. It's going to be a victory that, in my opinion, will happen much sooner than uh, originally expected. Our country is going to bounce back like you've never seen before. I think we're doing an incredible job. Weeks or months? Uh, you seem I'm not looking. I'm not looking at months. I can tell you right now. But that comes in fairly stark contrast to the likes of New York Governor Andrew Cuomo. Nobody can tell you is it four months, six months, eight months, nine months, but it is several months. Remember, it was only a week ago that Trump was saying the lockdown might last till July or August, and since then the confirmed cases have grown from about 6,000 to over 53,000 cases, although a number of those new cases would actually be old cases uncovered by more testing. Also, since last week, the deaths have grown from 109 to 687. So I wouldn't say they've exactly stopped the spread yet. And Andrew Cuomo knows this as well as anyone, because New York currently has about half of America's cases and 6% of the world's cases, by the way. You remember when Trump was comparing COVID-19 to the flu? Well, these are the hospital admissions in New York for flu or pneumonia-like illnesses for the last six months. That was the flu season there. And this is COVID-19 season. Fair to say it's worse than the flu. And the New York situation is probably even more dire than it seems. This was from the Corona Task Force coordinator, Deborah Burke. We're finding that 28% of the submitted specimens are positive from that area, where it's less than 8% in the rest of the country. 28% of the many tests being conducted in New York are positive. So how many COVID positive people in New York haven't been discovered yet? Having said all that, South Korea had COVID-19 pretty badly as well, and they managed to beat it without shutting the place down. It just requires a crap load of testing, enough testing to be able to isolate literally everyone in the country who has the virus. And America is making progress in that respect. There are now over 60,000 tests being conducted a day, pushing America up to totals that are reminiscent of South Korea and China, although those totals are a few days old for those two countries. If America can keep on ramping up the testing, get their hospitals a bit more COVID ready and somehow get New York under control, maybe they can safely end the lockdown then. But, John, there's plenty of work to do before that. Yeah, sure is. President Trump did invoke the Defence Production Act last week. That gives him sweeping powers to order private companies to produce medical supplies, things like ventilators or masks. But so far, he's holding off on giving those orders. He compares the DPA to Venezuelan socialism. Instead, he's putting his trust in the business community to meet the demand. We're a country not based on nationalising our business. Uh, uh, call a person over in Venezuela, ask them how did nationalization of their businesses work out? Not too well. But New York's Andrew Cuomo says they need those federal powers to be enforced to get those urgently needed supplies rolling in. Let the federal government put in place the Federal Defense Production Act. It does not nationalize any industry. Uh, all it does is say to a factory, you must produce this quantity. That's all it does. Now, Trump has pointed to some of the voluntary cooperation he's received from the private sector, like alcohol producers switching to making hand sanitizer instead. But the problem's a lot bigger than that. Within a week or two, New York needs 15,000 ventilators, 50 million surgical masks, and 3 million high-quality N95 masks. And they especially need those masks. New York is so low on masks that doctors are openly begging on Twitter for people to donate any masks they might have to hospitals. Those masks, they're meant to be single-use. 
but doctors are having to reuse them for up to a week, slathering them with hand sanitizer between shifts to supposedly clean them. In fact, shortages are so desperate that the CDC website has a section saying that where face masks aren't available, you might just have to make do with a bandana or scarf over your mouth. And this really matters because doctors in particular are getting sick from the virus. In Italy, 9% of all viral infections are among medical personnel. In Lombardy alone, a fifth of healthcare workers have had this virus, which of course makes things even harder for the severely outnumbered remaining healthcare staff. But where is New York supposed to get these masks from? China made half the world's masks before the virus started, but since then, China, as well as a number of other manufacturing hubs, are saving all the masks they make for themselves, leaving global demand for safety gear at 100 times higher than normal, prices 20 times higher than normal, and a four to six month backlog. Even worse, the deliveries that have arrived this year have actually been less frequent than the ones last year. Right across the board, there were more shipping containers of supplies last year than this year. And it's great that fashion designers are helping out with mask shortages, but unfortunately they simply aren't capable of making the really complicated N95 masks that doctors need. So it's hard to see where the Department of Health and Human Services is going to find the three and a half billion masks that they said that healthcare workers could require in the event of a pandemic. This is a pretty big issue, John. And that is a pretty big understatement, Chaz. Well, when it comes to weighing the risk to lives versus the risk to the American economy, President Trump says while he was worried at a mortality rate projected at between 3 and 4%, he's less concerned if it's under 1%. The mortality rate's a big thing for me because uh, I think we're very substantially under 1% now. That's... that's uh... It's still terrible. It's still the whole thing. The whole concept of death is terrible. But there's a tremendous difference between something under 1% and 4 or 5 or even 3%. It may be, but it is worth noting that if the mortality rate is as low as 0.7%, as some experts now hope, rather than between 3 and 5%, as the data suggests so far, that is still a lot of dead Americans. Californian health officials are bracing for a 56% infection rate. In New York, they're talking about a range of between 30% and 80%. So if we just lowball that, that is close to 700,000 dead Americans as a result of COVID-19. Modelling based on current social and economic disruption actually puts the number at 1.2 million people dying. All the way up to 2.2 million if no measures are taken to reduce contagion and the virus is allowed to run its course. Still, some are prepared to end the shutdown and risk it all in the name of the economy, like Lieutenant Governor of Texas Dan Patrick, who is 69 years old. He is a grandfather himself. He says older Americans like him should be prepared to literally sacrifice their lives for the sake of America's economic future. Let's get back to work. Let's get back to living. Let's be smart about it. Uh, and those of us who are 70 plus, we'll, we'll take care of ourselves, but don't sacrifice the country. Don't do that. Don't ruin so this you're, great American dream. So you're basically dream. saying that this disease could take your life, but that's not the scariest thing to you. There's something that would be worse than dying. Yeah. Not okay, boomers. And you know, Doctors schmockers, right? We're up to the doctors. They may say, let's keep it shut down. Let's shut down the entire world. Because again, you're up to almost 150 countries. So let's shut down the entire world. And when we shut it down, that'd be wonderful. And let's keep it shut for a couple of years. You know, we can't do that. Well, that's why I talk about the cure being worse than the problem. I don't think he was faithfully representing those experts there, but mm. this is what Trump means by a terrible cure. Goldman Sachs is predicting an absolutely monstrous level of initial unemployment claims in a few days' time. Three times higher than any time those records have existed. Goldman Sachs is forecasting a 24% decline in the next quarter. And sure, the economy may bounce back just as hard in the third quarter, but what if something goes wrong? America is playing with the economic dynamite at the moment. I, I will say this, though. Mm. Uh, Trump in that press noted that recessions cause deaths as well. 
suicides, deaths of despair, etc. Look, that's true. The research suggests that recessions do contribute to a growth in deaths from overdoses of prescription drugs, for example. But surprisingly, they also correlate with a reduction in cardiovascular disease deaths, a reduction in motor vehicle accident deaths, and an overall reduction in the all-cause mortality rate. So, at least in terms of deaths, a recession may not compare to a pandemic. But it might not be so great for Trump's re-election, of course. Or, though there have been some interesting results there as well. In the last month, unsurprisingly, more people have begun to believe the economy will be worse next year rather than better. But this hasn't changed Trump's net job approval ratings at all. People don't seem to be holding Trump responsible for the economy's collapse. At least not so far. No. Well, President Trump is not wrong about the cure sometimes being worse than the problem. The president has been talking up a possible COVID-19 treatment, an anti-malarial drug called chloroquine, even though it is not currently FDA approved for such use. A drug called chloroquine. And some people would add to it hydroxy, hydroxychloroquine. And there have been a number of reports of this particular drug being used to treat some patients who are on their last legs, and the FDA is fast-tracking trials to see if it's effective, but unfortunately some people aren't waiting for that. An Arizona man and his wife, both of them in their 60s, took a product called chloroquine to try and protect themselves from coronavirus. The woman says that they saw Trump on TV talking it up as a cure. Yeah. Yeah, we saw the, we saw his press conference. It was on a lot, actually. The kind of chloroquine, though, they had in their house was a cleaning product to be used on fish tanks. She is now in intensive care and Chaz, her husband, is dead. Yeah, I, I should say that that was chloroquine phosphate. But hydroxychloroquine seems to have its own dangers as well, John. China had a bit of a chloroquine fad back in February, but the authorities hastily put the brakes on it when it was found that chloroquine can kill you if you just dose up twice the recommended amount of one gram. Not to mention the dangers for the patients who are supposed to be taking chloroquine, like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus sufferers. Some of them may die if they don't get their chloroquine. And right now, doctors are getting calls every few minutes from patients who are trying to fill out their chloroquine when prescriptions and are finding it in short supply because of the COVID panic. This is why you need to be very careful who you take COVID-19 medical advice from. We hear a lot of people tell us that the main things we can do is wash our hands a lot, avoid touching surfaces, and practice social distancing. I mean, we get that, but are there other things that we should or could do that maybe we haven't focused on as much. You can kill the human coronavirus with Lysol. Yes, you can. That is known. You're saying that silver solution would be effective. You need nano silver toothpaste. You need super silver. You need super blue. You need ultimate turmeric uh, bodies back in stock. You need DNA force with CoQ10 and PQQ and so much more back in stock, 40% off. You need Ultra 12. You need Vitamin Mineral Fusion. You need Turbo Force now back in stock. You have Borage in there as well as Cayenne, Echinacea, Hyssop. There was an article about a medical study that showed that uh, vaping the whatever propofol something chloride in a vape is actually preventing people from getting... Well, uh, I saw that. I saw that, Sean. Don't speak out against my vaping. I like vaping. Of... These are awesome products. Try them and experience it because you can't lose. And I consider not my own body. Yes, consider yes. not my own body. To be able to cure a virus was said to be mathematically impossible. I consider not symptoms in my body. I consider not symptoms, symptoms in my body. What we're here to announce is the second cure to a virus of all time. <laughs> Healed and well? Yes. In the sweet name, name of Jesus. Jesus. Glory to God. Well, that's I mean, remarkable. I mean, of course, it's our job to be skeptical of all and any claims. However, I very much want to believe this. Well, for more, we're joined by Jeremy Kneindijk. He is one of America's leading experts in global outbreak preparedness. He is the former head of the U.S. Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, overseeing operations including the 2014 Ebola outbreak. He joins us from his home in Washington, D.C. Jeremy, welcome to the program. 
Thank you. We've heard in the last few hours President Trump wants to have America back in business and back at work by Easter. He wants to see those pews full on Easter Sunday. How realistic is that? Well, I think being fully back open for business in time for Easter is not realistic. What we need to do is get a, a range of different protective measures in place, as China did and as China, South Korea has, before we are ready to fully turn our economy back on. You know, if you turn the economy back on prematurely before you're ready to contain the disease, then all you guarantee is we're going to see this that we're going to see this movie again. We will see a second bump and spike in uh, in uh, the transmission of the virus, and that will overload hospitals again. So we need to make sure that we have brought the transmission of the disease down to a contained level, and then that we have reinforced our our hospitals, that we have reinforced our public health capacity, so that rather than uh, waiting for the disease to show up at the emergency room doors, we can actually fight it in the trenches um, through public health measures. As we're seeing more of this outbreak, Jeremy, and we're learning more about COVID-19, are you becoming more or less worried? I think both. I think I'm, I'm becoming more worried about the potential for large-scale spread in the United States. You know, we still do not have a good picture of where all this is and how far it has spread. But I think what we're seeing in New York is a preview of what we could be seeing in other major American cities. And, and that, is, that is very scary indeed. And I think that's why the sort of uh, shelter in place and economic pause activities right now are so important. I think where I'm optimistic is what we have seen from other countries is that even when we are this far down the road towards uh, a large scale spread within, within the United States, it is a, it's, a, it's a winnable fight. Uh, you know, China shows that, South Korea shows that. You know, if you go through this painful period, it's a winnable fight, but it takes discipline and it takes patience. It's not going to happen in a matter of a few weeks. It's going to take a few months. Jeremy, given that measures in Wuhan extended to literally welding shut doors to stop people leaving yeah. apartment buildings, is the United mm. States, with its tendency towards individual liberties and freedoms, uh, people being empowered to make their own decisions, is America uniquely vulnerable to the COVID-19 virus? I don't think that Americans will need the kind of draconian measures that we saw in China. We do need a clear vision for how we get out of this, and I'm afraid we're not seeing that yet at the national level. Each state is applying their own measures, but if they're not doing that in a consistent way, then it undermines everyone. Jeremy, President Trump for weeks now has faced criticism for downplaying the, the threat of the pandemic, talking up the economy, trying to bolster the, the stock market. Mm -hmm. How do you mm -hmm. weigh that very real concern that there are... There are implications not just for people losing money, but with money comes the ability for people to pay for their own medical services yeah. and so on. I mean, lives are yeah. lost when money is lost as well. How, how do you yeah. factor that kind of an equation? Yeah, I mean, it's a very difficult one. Uh, you know, the bottom line, I think, is that you can't fix the economic problems until you have fixed the health problems. Um, it is bad for the economy to hit pause on human mobility and huge amounts of business activity, but it's also very bad for the economy if we start seeing hospitals collapse and people can't get medical treatment when they have a heart attack or a car accident. Um, you know, I think that the fastest way to, to right the ship economically is by throwing everything we can at the, defeating the disease. And I think it is unfortunate that the administration has kind of seen those things as somewhat distinct. Um, I think that they're getting better on that, but particularly early on, President Trump seemed to be focused on downplaying the threat of the disease, as you said, because he was worried about economic damage. And I think what he has failed to understand is that ultimately the economic damage will be driven by the disease. And to solve uh, the one, we need to solve the other first. Jeremy Kanindak, many thanks indeed for your time. My pleasure. Thank you. Earlier today, there was supposed to be a primary in the state of Georgia and another one on Sunday in Puerto Rico. Both have been postponed over the coronavirus. Georgia until May 19. It looks as though that'll probably be an all-postal ballot at this stage. Puerto Rico put off till April 26th. And so far, a total of seven primaries have been delayed. And that is throwing the Democratic nomination process into a weird kind of limbo. It is down to former Vice President Joe Biden and Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders after Tulsi Gabbard dropped out last week and endorsed Biden. And Joe Biden does have a substantial delegate lead that he's built up over Sanders, but Sanders is still resisting calls so far to drop out. Biden, on the other hand, is holding on to his recent lead in the average of national polls. He's almost 20 points ahead. Still, 
Neither of them are actively campaigning, with no rallies allowed, no volunteers allowed to go door knocking, no phone banks even calling voters. Like tens of millions of Americans, Vice President Biden is actually working from his home in Wilmington, Delaware, from his living room giving kind of presidential style daily briefings. For too long, the warning signs were ignored. For too long, the administration said the threats were, quote, under control, quote, contained, quote, like the flu. The president says no one saw this coming. Well, that's just not accurate. Our intelligence officials were warning of coronavirus threat in January. For his part, Bernie Sanders, as a sitting senator, has been on Capitol Hill working on this stimulus bill, and he says his campaign has moved entirely online. We had a wonderful town meeting uh, last night uh, with uh, several of the leading members of Congress, uh, which I thought was very productive and a large viewing audience. So we're coming, kind of moving day by day. Talking about the election, these corona briefings are really doing something for Trump's standing. After a week of those briefings, approval of Trump's handling of the crisis moved from 43% to 55%. Even Democratic approval is up to 30%. So keep an eye on that one. There's no doubt we're living through extraordinary times. In some ways, it is an unprecedented situation, although exactly 100 years ago, there was an election year that bears some surprising similarities. In late 1918, the First World War was finally coming to a close after four long years of attrition and bloodshed. Empires and emperors had crumbled, a communist revolution had swept Russia, more than eight and a half million soldiers were dead. The United States had joined the war late but decisively for the Allied cause and lost over 100,000 men. As the guns fell silent and the troops headed home, they brought with them a new strain of the influenza virus dubbed the Spanish flu. The pandemic that followed would claim more lives than the war itself. 50 million people dead around the world, 675,000 in the United States. 33 million Americans, one third of the population, fell ill. Censors used the Wartime Sedition Act to hush up the full impact to preserve morale. Democratic President Woodrow Wilson was planning to run for a third term in 1920. His most likely rival was former Republican President Theodore Roosevelt. It was shaping up to be a colossal political fight. Then, on the night of January 5, 1919, 60-year-old Roosevelt, weakened by jungle diseases he'd contracted on a hunting expedition, suddenly died. His son, Archibald, telegrammed his family to say simply, the old lion is dead. Then, President Wilson caught the flu. He recovered, but in October 1919, Wilson suffered a stroke. He was bedridden and unable to speak for months, a fact that was kept from the public and even his closest aides. Wilson's wife, Edith, effectively became acting president. President Wilson regained some strength, but was unfit for re-election in 1920. The Democratic nomination eventually went to Ohio Governor John Cox. The Republicans nominated another Ohioan, Senator Warren G. Harding. And it was Harding who captured America's mood. Weary of war, the flu pandemic and political revolution, with a speech at the Protectionist Home Market Club in Boston in May 1920. First came Harding's diagnosis. There isn't anything the matter with the world civilization except that humanity is viewing it through a vision impaired in a cataclysmal war. Poise has been disturbed and nerves have been racked and fever has rendered men irrational. And then his prescription. America's present need is not heroic but healing. Not nostrums, but normals, not revolution, but restoration. And that one slightly odd word, normalcy, became Harding's catch cry. His election slogan, a return to normalcy. It was enough to win him the election, but Harding's time in office wasn't exactly normal. His administration was deeply corrupt. He passed openly racist restrictions on immigration. The Ku Klux Klan was reborn and paraded in front of the White House. And while Harding didn't personally profit from the presidency, he was more focused on gambling and philandering than governing. In early 1923, President Harding contracted the flu, then pneumonia. 
He died of heart failure that August. Although Harding died before most of his administration scandals were revealed, he has gone down as one of America's worst ever presidents. The Spanish flu pandemic changed many lives and the course of American history. Every day we're seeing a battle play out between the media and the president for the trust of the American people. And according to one poll this week, Trump is only trusted by 37% of the public. Mind you, the media weren't much better off with only 50% of the public trusting them. So where does that leave us? Where does that leave us? It leaves us at the wall! Big, beautiful world. Now, it is fair to say that there is not a lot of trust in the mass media these days. Over the last two decades, those who trust the reporting of newspapers, TV and radio slowly but steadily fallen. That trend is clear with independents. It was clear with Democrats until Trump came along and then the Democrats loved how the media got into him. But surprisingly, Republicans weren't so keen on that particular trend. Now, only 15% of Republicans trust the media's reporting. Yeah, I'm surprised it's that high with Republicans as well, Tucker. Yeah. But these changing attitudes to the media have very real effects. Weekday circulation in newspapers has been dropping and dropping for 30 straight years. It was down 8% again in 2018 to the lowest level on record. And that record goes back to 1940. By the way, that drop there includes digital subscriptions as well. In fact, even if we look at just news websites, they really haven't been doing much at all lately. So consequently, that means newspaper revenue hasn't been doing much lately either. Not circulation revenue and not advertising revenue. That's really fallen through the floor since 2005. And if newspapers are struggling for revenue, what happens? The industry loses 47% of its newsroom staff from 2004 to today, which of course reduces the quality of the product, which makes people less likely to trust it and so on. But don't worry, because cable news revenue has grown by about a third since 2015. So we're in for a lot more of Fire this. Trick. I want to move on. Yeah. 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 Music to my ears. But while that kind of stuff is very trust building, there was an interesting study in 2018 where people were asked to distinguish between five factual statements and five opinion statements. And only 26% of them got them all right. But 39% of those who trust the national news media a lot got them all right. And only 18% who don't trust the national news media much got them all right. So I don't know what's the cause and what's the effect there, if any, but trust in the national news media does seem to correlate with a sense of fact versus opinion. And that's an important sense because 60% of people say they regularly see conflicting reports about the same set of facts from different sources. Are those reports facts? or are they opinions? And 47% say it's difficult to know whether the information they're encountering is true. So for those who don't trust the media's reporting of facts, and I'm not saying the media are perfect, but it then leaves you to work out what's true. And that might be why in a 2019 poll, 66% of people said they were worn out by the amount of news. In particular, 75% of Republicans who don't trust the media. So if you're cynical about the news and you have to slog your way through competing narratives, it could leave you exhausted and even more cynical about the news media. Oh, and there is one other source of discontent about the media, of course. You're fake news. You're fake news. You are fake news. The media critic in chief. See, I don't think that the Mainstream media is free speech either, because it's so crooked, it's so dishonest. So to me, free speech is not when you see something good and then you purposely write bad. To me, that's very dangerous speech, and you become angry at it. I know you become angry at it. And ideas like that have percolated through the community, with 28% of people, including 42% of Republicans saying that accurate news stories casting a politician or political group in a negative light are always fake news. 
accurate stories are always fake news if they're negative. So the media has their work cut out for them, earning people's trust back. It's a good thing that news outlets like the ABC are so frank and fearless. Hey, John? John? Go away! We may need a break. Big, beautiful world. And that is it for Planet America for this week. A reminder, though, we will be on at the all-new earlier time of 9.30pm next Wednesday and night. And we will be back with a fireside chat on the News Channel at 8pm on Friday. And you'll find more on IG, YouTube and Facebook. It's yes, there. but until then, one of the few good things to come out of all of this just might be Neil Diamond, who's come up with a COVID-friendly version of one of his beloved classics. Bye-bye. Hands, washing hands. Reaching out, don't touch me, I won't touch you.